Hello and welcome to the Third Round channel. I'm Pierre Delancey. However many times you try, some things just don't work. For the past two decades, the arts and cultural establishment in the UK has been trying to engage a wider set of audiences in the work. Countless initiatives to make the arts more accessible to the public and to make them more relevant have been advocated for in policy and funding settlements. Much work has gone into delivering cultural activities to communities who are usually excluded. But the dial on who participates and how much has not shifted, despite many thousands of people trying to address the problem. But wait, this isn't even the punchline. Not only do the interventions not work, nobody involved in them admits that their interventions may have failed. Thousands and thousands of projects over 20 years have failed to make a difference, but not a single one of them has failed. Having spent many years working in cultural policy studies, Leila Jansevic and David Stevenson take the arts and culture sector to task over this fiction. The book Failures in Cultural Participation puts a mirror to the industry and invites cultural policymakers, organizations and practitioners to confront the failures. The book shifts the debate from the value of culture to considerations of how policies can be designed and implemented and argues for an honest and transparent acknowledgement of failures at individual, organizational and governmental levels. As ever, you'll find links to some of the projects we discuss, including the Failspace framework, in the show notes. From there, you can also join my newsletter with my writing on arts and culture and support my work. David, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to join you. Thank you. Thank you for placing all this trust in me. I'm not sure how much of a pleasure this is going to be, because as I warned you before we pressed record, David, I have I have views on the topic, as I often do in my interviews, but here I really have quite strong views. So maybe to avoid embarrassment, I wonder if we could try to do this this interview in one sentence. Does cultural participation work? One word answer, if you can. Um, I, if, I'm, if I'm going to go on one, no. Um, <laughs> and that's, okay, good. Let, that's let's let's stop that. Let, I was trying to set you up, but never mind that. I'll be able to clip you out saying no, but let's That's rewind and try to introduce you properly and treat you seriously. If I could ask you to introduce your research interest and how your collaboration with your co-author, Leila Lansevich, came about and why it is that we should be interested in cultural participation at all, that would be great. So this project came about because both Leila and I had worked together informally on projects in the past, but we both published separately about, about similar types of issues. Um, Leila's work in particular had looked at the distribution of funding um, and the imbalances that exist in the way in which uh, funding is distributed in the UK, particularly towards larger institutions, uh, more established institutions that come mm -hmm. from particular types of art forms. Um, and the work that I'd done was really looking at the way in which certain people's cultural participation was devalued um, through the labelling of those individuals as non-participants, a suggestion mm -hmm. that it was possible to be a cultural non-participant. And so we'd both been aware of each other's work. We'd both been aware of, of what we were doing. We'd both gone to conferences. And we realised that we'd both been doing this now for you know, over a decade in terms of writing about this. Mm -hmm. And I guess we got a bit frustrated to go, is anybody paying any attention? We felt like we were making the same arguments. And we were not the only people making those arguments. Lots mm -hmm. of other people were as well. And yet it came to the point that once again, another uh, policy document comes around that says we're going to commit to having arts for all. We're going to commit to widening access. We're going to provide funding to organizations and they're <laughs> going to do a really good job and they're all going to work really hard and they're going to diversify their audience and diversify their staff. And we sort of felt a little bit like that, that people must be missing our work um, because they kept doing the same stuff. And, you know, <laughs> oh God, uh, the frustration of the academic. <laughs> why why uh, is nobody paying attention? Why has no one paid any obvious... attention to me? I mean, I published a paper. <laughs> um, surely the world should have changed. We were really struck by the fact that, 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 that this sort of continued to feel like it was in a loop. And if you looked at you mm -hmm. know, statistics that came out taking part, uh, which looks in, in England, um, uh, the Scottish Household Survey in Scotland, Again, the data doesn't really point towards much change. I think it was a meeting I'd gone down to see Leila at Leeds, and it was probably the first time that we, that we explicitly started to use the word, why do we keep doing stuff that's failing? And it was at that meeting that we sort of realised that actually the word failure or failing 
doesn't really feature an awful lot in, mm. in much of the discourse of cultural policy. There's, there's never a suggestion that things are failing. There's never a point at which we have failed to diversify cultural participation. And that was really the genesis of it, was this, this idea that the disconnect between what we were observing, which was a failure, a failure to deliver on what was the stated aims of national policies, local policies, individual organizations' policies around about, in particular, diversity mm -hmm. um, and around about supporting a wider breadth of cultural participation activities. And yet, at the same time, people repeating the things that had delivered a failure, had, had not delivered the results they were looking for. And so that was where the work began from. And it, and it began, first of all, with a relatively innocent question, which is, why don't we talk about failure when it feels like it's so present um, in terms of this, mm. this area of work? Um, and it certainly wasn't done from the outset around about being judgmental. It was more around about saying, why is everybody so happy doing stuff that isn't <laughs> doing the thing that they say it wants to do. It, it sort of seems somewhat incongruous that mm. everybody's talking about, you know, how to support and diversify cultural participation. And yet they're also perfectly content to do work that on the basis of evidence is not actually delivering those results. So as with all good research, it, it sort of started with a, a relatively genuine puzzle, which was like, this doesn't really make sense if you stop and think about it. Um, and from there, we sort of expanded out into... A whole world of failure. That's fantastic. And I think this might help us layer our frustration with the underlying topic a little bit, because in as much as your book is an incredibly thorough catalogue of all the literature and all the pointers to ongoing failings in the widening participation agenda, which I, I would like us to talk about as an agenda and as a kind of set of matrices in a moment, but there is no real way to address the fact that nobody seems to really want to notice. Because for me, for my kind of square understanding of how one deals with policy, if you try something for 30 years and it doesn't work, you would suggest that maybe you should pull the plug on the particular project and try something else. Now, there are many, many reasons why policymaking doesn't work like that at all. And you go over them in a the book. But the value in what you've done, for me, certainly, is in the fact that you repeatedly drive home this one taboo word. And of course, there might be many, many different types of thinking about this. You know, you could have, you could have settled on the, word of, for, on the word evidence, for instance, and you would have written a book in which you say, there is, however, no evidence that X does Y. So failure, in as much as it's a very simple word, it's kind of potent because it lets you test how much the very possibility of non-delivering or non somehow a betrayal of this whole project would ever be discussed. But before we get into any of the details and the kind of hierarchy that you set up for, for thinking about this, maybe for the benefit of those of our listeners who are not yet as horrified as I am by, by what we're talking about, we could try to set out a bit of a history of what it is that we're trying to achieve here. Like, what, what mm. does widening participation mean? Who, who should be participating in what? And maybe we can start thinking about why the state would be involved in, in thinking about this in any sense. Yeah, so in a, a sort of potted history of this argument and, and something I often use when I'm teaching or we're kind of working with students is, is that final point that you said is, is starting from the assumption that the state has anything to do with people's mm. cultural participation. In certain countries, that is sort of taken unproblematically now. It's sort of accepted that this, of course, the state should be involved in, in people's cultural lives. But the UK, which is where the book's focused on, and, and that's where the work was done, this is you know a relatively recent uh, adaptation to, to what is deemed to be acceptable. And really, you know, this is a is a post-war agreement uh, that the, the state would have anything to do with culture. Before that, the sense of culture mm. and what people did with their cultural lives was, was absolutely not something for the state to be involved in. And so this is at the heart of, of some of the difficulty, is that you then have the support given to culture by the state as something that is seen as being an important marker of status for a country, as, as an important marker of a country that is mm -hmm. a strong, democratic, progressive society, that it is able to direct money towards cultural activities because it recognizes the value of those cultural activities for its citizens 
um, for its identity as a country um, and for all of the potential capacity that, that culture has for both creating our sense of self and allowing us to explore our sense of self. And so there is a very strong um, attachment to the idea mm -hmm. that uh, the state should support culture. And the book doesn't you know, make a value judgment about that. It doesn't go into that space. But what it does pick up is from around about the 1980s in the UK going forward, there started to become more of a question about whether spending on culture was a good thing as the amount of money that's available to government reduces through other mm -hmm. choices that are made around about things like taxation. There is a constant pressure on what we have to acknowledge is, is a relatively proportionately small budget in terms of the yeah. overall budget of the UK. But it is a budget that nevertheless is constantly embattled around about whether it should even exist um, and mm -hmm. whether we should spend any taxpayers' money on cultural activities. And part of the reason for that is that towards the end of sort of the John Major government, well, actually starting in the Thatcher government, then towards the end of the John Major government, um, there was an emergence that said, actually, these are the, you know, these are the pastimes and the hobbies of the elite. And mm -hmm. that argument is a dangerous argument because it can be used by both sides of the political spectrum. So on, on one side, you have, uh, you know, people of a particular perception who might look at it and say, well, actually, you know, these are primarily the elite that are going, they can afford to pay for it themselves. So, so why on earth would we be paying for this? On the other side, you have people that say that's a problem, we should worry about this, because actually, these things are valuable, and they may be valuable to people in a way that they don't understand. So a kind of market failure argument, whereby the market isn't functioning properly. And some of those people who would benefit most from having mm. these cultural opportunities in their life are not going. And so you get a different argument that says, we recognize that the money is, is unequitably spread out and that it supports a particular strata of society way more than any other strata. But their response is not to just cut it and say, well, actually, pay for it yourself. Their response yeah. is to worry about how we diversify and widen the people who benefit from it. And that's been a very dominant perspective in the UK since around the late 90s, the idea of audience development. And fundamentally, um, it's what has been called a crisis of legitimacy in the academic text, which is that organisations that receive significant public subsidy who are unable to point towards a fully representative audience, um, a fully representative workforce, a fully representative um, output from the work that they do, are constantly facing a crisis of whether they are legitimate recipients of public money. And so there has been an increasing growth, an increasing push towards diversifying the audiences, the people who are taking part. And part of that has got caught up in a narrative around about the idea of widening participation, because really what we're talking about is widening participation with organisations that receive public subsidy yeah. um, in a particular UK context. So that, that is what we are worried about, is how can we have a wider range of people taking part in these? And so on one hand, you have an argument that says, fundamentally, there are benefits to taking part in these organisations that you cannot re recreate anywhere else. And so actually, we need to spread the benefits of these as widely as possible. There's a moral imperative to do it. On the other hand, there's people that say, really, this is not about the audiences. This is about you as an organisation defending your own right to exist by ensuring that you're able to point towards more yeah. diverse audiences. Now, to all intents and purposes in the book, we, we don't take a side on this. Um, we, we don't say that one is right or the other. You know. mm. But what we point out is that no matter what side of the argument that you're on, it still failed. You know, whether you're looking to, to spread the benefits more broadly or whether you're looking to defend your own organization's legitimacy through having a more mm. diverse audience, the audiences for publicly subsidized culture are broadly still the same and have been the same for 20 yeah. years. That all of this intervention has not changed in a significant way the patterns or behaviors of what people are taking part with and the nature of who is, in that regard, getting the biggest slice of that public subsidy. 
So that broadly in a nutshell is where the issue is. And as I say, the book is relatively agnostic on either argument. That's not to say Leila and I are, um, but for the purposes of the book, we weren't <laughs> going to take a position. We've taken our positions no, no, I, elsewhere. I, 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 think, I think you should take a position right now <laughs> and show us your voting patterns. But if I may, I'm going to add a, a third argument to it, which you do nod at, that um, the drive to professionalise participation, whether it's through organisations trying to create participation activities to, you know, to make opera accessible to everyone, or whether it's through funding forms of culture that already exist. Actually, both these arguments also undermine slightly more low-level, unofficial, everyday culture activities that used to prior to the 90s and the kind of explosion at the time in funding of professional culture in the UK. They used to com completely come underneath the radar. So one of the pieces of statistics that you refer to time and time again in the book is the Taking Part survey, which is one, one of the big data sets that the UK has about you know, what it is that people do with their free time, whether they go and play tennis or whether they go to the cinema or to, or indeed to see Tosca. And time and time again, we see that things like going to listen to some live music in a pub, which, you know, until very recently was nothing to do with any organization that would report to the state. But that somehow gets both ignored in the stats and then neglected in any strategic thinking. Um, and funnily enough, from my recent experiences and you know, talking about um, participation and social practice in, in a museum in Poland only last week, I get the feeling that the potentially populist argument for kind of trying to destroy the professional managerial class of the art world would be to, that once we close down all these elitist museums and opera houses, people will go back to producing authentic cultures all by themselves, which is, of course, yet another fiction, but we, we might have to wait a few few years to see whether that works. Yeah, out. I think, uh, no, I mean, I, I fully agree. I think that to a certain extent, I would tie that in with the legitimacy argument, which is that yeah. um, in an attempt to legitimise, you know, particular roles, particular professions, particular functions, there has also been a creeping approach that then takes people's participation they're already doing and repackages it and sells it back to themselves. Because... It's a response to a failing to get them to engage in the activity that's already there. So all of a sudden, as you say, your cultural petition needs to become mediated by a professional in some way, shape or form, yeah. you know, even if you were doing that activity beforehand. And I think if I go back to, to other research or things that I've done before, I remember one piece of work that I did and in, in interviewing some women that had taken part in a knitting activity. And so the activity had a particular a particular frame around about it, around about how it was about including people within those communities. And what was really striking to me when I spoke to all the women who were taking part in that activity is they all did it before. They were all, they were <laughs> all doing it previously. And likewise, for this piece of work, one of the, the projects that we talk about in the book, and I have to say thank you to the projects that allowed us to actually name them in the book. Mm. You know, uh, on one hand, I, it, that shouldn't be something remarkable, but it wasn't easy to get everybody or people to agree to that. But but these ones did. And Creative People in Places, which is a project um, uh, in England, and that was, again, around about kind of participatory work. I interviewed some people that were involved in that. And, and one area always stuck in my mind, or one interview um, around about one project. And again, they said that they, they were really struggling to get people to take part in this, this music and dance activities that they were putting mm -hmm. on um, and that they were creating. But it wasn't until they, they realized, and they actually went to, it was a religious space, it's a faith-based space, um, and they found that the people were there and they were playing music um, and they were playing instruments and they were doing all <laughs> of the things that they were trying to persuade them to do. And I guess to me that always comes up, and I, I use this quite a bit when I'm sort of teaching marketing for arts organizations, is the idea of opportunity costs, an idea from, you know, from economics. Mm. What do people give up in order to do the things that you're asking them to do? And I think that so often there is a sort of perception that certain people are sitting doing absolutely nothing valuable, nothing culturally valuable or meaningful to them. And so there's an assumption that you're inviting them to do something that's brilliant. But as I always say, you know, I don't go to the theatre that much. I don't go out to those spaces. And if you want me to go out on a Saturday night, you know, you need to give me a, a better offer than me sitting in my bath, um, you know, with some crisps and a drink. Now, fundamentally, that's an opportunity <laughs> this cost. Is, I, think, I think pictures will be included with the show notes of you <laughs> sitting in a bath with a drink and some crisps, David. But. <laughs> um, but you always have to, 
we have to start from an assumption. And I think, you know, and, and we pick up on work that's been, mm. been done by, by others around about the deficit model, that so much of what is done within cultural policy is on the assumption of a deficit, that there are just people who are absent or, or have an absence in their life of cultural participation. And I think the overriding argument that kind of sits behind my work and Leila's work and that underpins some of the arguments in the book is what if we started from an assumption whereby actually there is an abundance of cultural participation going on um, and quite a significant amount of it doesn't necessarily need much uh, intervention and that we recognise that, that this position, and I think you know earlier on I said we don't take a position in the book, but you know if anybody's read anything else that either myself or Leila have read, I'm sure they know our position. But fundamentally, yes, that we use the resources that we have within the state more equitably to support cultural participation in all of its forms, wherever it is taking place. And that we start from a curiosity model rather than a model of seeking to, to go mm. out and to give people things that they may already have. Okay, this is interesting because you've just essentially positioned yourself as a class traitor to a certain extent, maybe parking the pejorative connotations I would, given that you're an academic with, you know, a book out and I imagine as stable as a position as, as they go. You are you're yep. a member of the professional managerial class, on which yes. I congratulate you. But you are in the book critiquing that very kind of <laughs> entrenched position of any mm -hmm. of these artists, stroke producers, stroke funders. I did have a joke at the end of this, but it's kind of difficult really, <laughs> really to make one. I don't know whether I've said it out loud. But I want to actually steer us to think about the positive thing that you do. Because in as much as I think it would be naive to think that nobody understands how wrong this history has been going for so long, your contribution is both necessary and valuable. So let's talk about how you went around producing the model and gathering your data. And I want to talk specifically about this kind of disarmingly simple model of workshops, the, the, the resources you've produced, not even as a you know, not even as a kind of happy payoff at the end, and this is what we should do. But but mm. I think the simplicity but through which you gathered your data and you prompted your interviewees and, and a whole bunch of other people to to come and talk about the F word. Yes. I think I think that will be in and of itself quite enlightening. One of the things I would say as well is that in terms of our framework, Leila and I um try to use the framework on our own work. And I think one of the other things, and, and just to pick up your point about, you know, my own secure position, because it is vital. And one of the things that Leila and I are talking about is how do we talk about the failures of this project? Hmm. Because fundamentally, we still are failing to get people to change their minds. People love talking about our project and, you know, they might like talking about failure, but to a certain extent, we are still to see significant change. And so we started out, um, and again, I'm kind of, speaking on behalf of Leila here, but certainly I, I think she would agree with me, possibly slightly naive in that we thought it would be easier to get people to talk about failure, that we designed workshops and we'd given some thought to how to make sure that people felt they were, they were safe. We recognised that mm -hmm. people might not want to talk about failures with people on whom their livelihoods relied. And so what we did to begin with was we started with a series of workshops and those workshops um, were in four locations um, kind of around the UK. We invited people to come along. We worked with an artist researcher, Lucy Wright, um, to try to take quite a creative approach to the workshops. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, we allowed people to self-identify as, as one of four types of stakeholders um, within this, this cultural space. So they could either say that they were representing an organisation um, they could say that they were a kind of policymaker or a funder. They could say that they were an artist who engaged in this type of work, or they could say they were a participant. And we kept those, those groups separate. And we did that because we had an assumption that, that people might be slightly more closed if they were faced with other stakeholders and that the conversation mm -hmm. might become defensive that we wanted to avoid. And so in those workshops, we used various approaches, um, creative drawing, uh, mapping out approaches, to get people to explore ideas of failure. And often our first route into it was via success. So we asked people to talk about uh, projects that they perceived to be successful mm -hmm. cultural participation projects, um, even if they'd never taken part in them. 
Because what we were also quite struck by was the extent to which certain projects often take on a sort of uh, a mythical status as being particularly good examples of these participation projects, even if people have never been anywhere near them, but they just kind of exist <laughs> in the literature as, as best practice. And, and that's, again, academia has something to hold its hands up in that regard. And so we then going into those routes and getting people to talk about the failures that they'd experienced in projects and um, to talk with each other about those failures. But we also had, uh, we had a little box that came with us. I say little, it's quite big. Um, it was probably far heavier than we needed. It was terribly difficult to get in the car. Um, and it was an honesty box. And people could write on cards things that they felt they couldn't say in the room, in the workshop. And what was really striking, and this, I think, was where Leila and I first realized quite how fearful people were, mm -hmm. was that at the end of these workshops, we thought, these are great. You know, we're getting really good stuff. People are talking about it really well. You know, we were giving ourselves a bit of a you know, clap on the back and saying, great job. You've done a good job here. And then we opened the box and we looked at the honesty cards. And all of a sudden, there was another tier. There was another layer of people. Um, and it's the people writing things like, I fucking hate cultural participation work. I only do it because it's the only way I can get money. Um, you know, I lie on my evaluations all the time and wow. everybody does it. And that that opening of that honesty box that were entirely anonymous and people could just write the cards and put it in as they were going along really opened up our eyes and the way we then approach this going forward to recognize that there was fear. Even when we created a relatively safe environment whereby you were only with people who had no influence over your you know, future career or future funding, people still felt unable to talk fully openly about failure. There was, there was that much baggage around about mm. the word. And that really then shaped what we went on to do in our interviews that we did in the sort of second stage of the work, because they were one-to-one. -one, and it really allowed us to try to dig in, to explore those in more depth. And one of the big things that got added in to the interviews that we didn't do in the workshops was the role of essentially evaluators. Mm -hmm. We'd not really categorized them or thought about them particularly to begin with. But the individuals who are commissioned to take part in evaluations became kind of a key group. And that's why in the book, we talk about kind of cultural professionals more widely, because again, yeah. part of the people that we've got within this mix are the people whose job it is to consistently evaluate this work. So yeah, so that, that was... Broadly, what we did, we also had a survey um, online that was fully anonymous and allowed people, again, to give us fully anonymized data. But we also, particularly uh, Lucy did this work, um, we did some kind of deep hanging out, essentially, with um, communities in some of the places where the successful projects had been identified. And then we also went back to some of those successful organizations and we said to them, look, you were identified in the first workshops as being examples of, of success when it comes to cultural participation. We assume that you didn't just have success, that you had failures, and would you be willing to talk to us about those failures? And that was hard. We actually really struggled. And I think Scotland, Scotland let me down on that one. Um, all of the, the Scottish <laughs> organizations that I approached said they weren't happy to do that openly. Again, the, the, the extent to which the fear exists that people cannot feel able to talk about this stuff even a big organization was was unable to do it so we were very grateful as i, as I said to the organizations that allowed us to, to profile them in the book so i guess the the next question which i think was probably more difficult than than i imagined to answer is where that kind of reluctance comes from because we could we could spend a lot of time having a kind of jolly wheeze and I would I would happily be naming organizations that you you might be obliged not to name and pointing to one type of failure after another one example of failure after another many of which have been subject to academic writing but I think the second thing potentially more interesting that your research points to is to try to figure out why we are so drawn to put a head in the sand and I guess if I wanted to ask you an instrumental and kind of disarming question is, whose fault is this thing? My tendency is to try to blame the PMC, 
So blame, mm. blame the people involved in actually delivering the services, delivering the art, producing the participation, uh, you know, creating the tea dancers and or creating the adjuncts to the royal opera houses, um, outreach activities. And that's kind of easy for me to do because this is the, the practice I come from. And this is the stuff I care about. And I look at my colleagues and I see them both wasting their talents, but also participating in a grift. Mm. But not that I want to let this, this class off the hook, but I wonder where this all starts. And you order the book in a sequence from the top down. So can we hang this all on, on the messy process of policy making? Please say no, but it would be great if you could try to explain why, why the rot sets in all the way with, with government. Yeah, some of this will come back, to, I think, to probably a, a discipline and a kind of methodological bias that I carry with me. I tend not to identify the blame with any individuals, but I guess that's because within that, I would argue that those individuals are a product of the discourse itself and are unable to challenge it without removing their own status. So that that becomes problematic in and of mm -hmm. itself, in that we are so far along with this that people have built careers, people have built status, people have built their livelihoods on it, people have mortgages. And one of the things that I always stress or try to do if I'm if I'm doing workshops without the book or I'm, I'm working with organizations is I have to build a degree of trust that says, look, I'm not here to try and just shut you down because I recognize that actually you have individual responsibilities, that your salary matters. You know, the world is, is difficult in that regard. Um, and again, if you go to complexity theory and policy, on one hand, it's great because it says, yeah, everything's complex. On a pragmatic, how do we change <laughs> it? Uh, it doesn't really help. And I think that was one of the things that we really tried to do with this book that I probably haven't done, in, if I'm honest, certainly in my writing in the past. I tend to use a lot of critical theory. That's great. Yeah. I can turn up. I can slag everybody off and, you know, I can leave again. And a critique that I would always throw at myself is I'm like, yeah, but you also know that pragmatically it's not that easy unless you're going to have a revolution. So how do you work within that space and, and what does it function? So I think that the book works from the premise that says what we identified was a dysfunctional relationship between all of the people involved that to some extent everybody was aware of. Mm. And that was the thing I think that was the saddest about the whole process. And again, you know, it would be very easy for me to go out and to, to bash some funders or to bash some policymakers. And to be fair, there is some bashing to be done. Um, mm. But actually, every single person that I spoke to in the interviews that I did for this, the funders or policymakers were as aware that this stuff isn't working. They felt as trapped in terms of how to address this. They knew that people were not always honest on their evaluations, but they didn't want to call them out on it because what were they going to do? Were they going to strip them of funding and shut them down? Were they going to, you know, put people out of work? Were they going to, you know, publicly humiliate them for, for not being honest in that space? And so, again, they felt as trapped because they also recognized that they had to report into governments, to ministers, to the media, uh, to mm -hmm. the extent to which, you know, they said, we cannot talk about failing in terms of public sector. If we spend public money and we were honest about where things are failing, you know, we would be ripped apart um, in the media and that's not going to get us anywhere. And so everybody we spoke to knew that we were trapped in this system of it not quite working. But nobody feels that they have enough agency, power or security in order to change it. Everybody within the system that we spoke to feels precarious in some way, feels that actually their, their ability to exert power is limited, that their ability to make change is constrained by somebody else. Now, some of those constraints are real, but some of them were perception based. And some of them were based upon an assumption that, for example, funders don't want to hear honest stories about what their funding mm. does. And actually, if I take on face value the people we spoke to, they said, yes, we do. 
We absolutely do. What we don't want is for people to keep doing the same thing over and over and not responding to it. But we want to have a conversation where someone says, this didn't work and this is how it can change. Um, and that is, I guess, the pragmatic space that we've kind of then ended up with our, our framework and our toolkit. And, and I guess it is, it's sort of an uncomfortable place for two people that primarily write critically to deal mm. with because there's just, there, are, there are challenges. It's a very instrumental kind of slightly technical uh, response to what is fundamentally a political problem around about you know, the distribution of power between different groups. But what we always try to stress, and I think this is the, one of the areas that we feel that we are failing in at the moment, is we didn't design our tools to be prescriptive in terms of how they were used. We designed yeah. our tools to create opportunities for people to just start talking about this stuff in a way that is more open and more nuanced. But the danger or the failure that we have is that as soon as you call something a toolkit or you put something into a triangle or a box, everybody yeah. goes, oh, there's a right way to use it. And you know, we need to get David and Layla to come and you know, do a workshop with us on it. And that's, that's a failure. That would be a failure for us if, if actually... All that comes from this is that we get a bit of reputation and that lots of people ask us to come and do a workshop. Fundamentally, the tools are about getting people to start the conversation that they told us they wanted to have. They wanted to have a conversation about the fact that this stuff is failing because it makes people miserable. If everybody knows it's not working, it makes people feel that their, their work is not valuable, that they're not achieving where they want to. And, and they wanted to get that out in the open. So... I think I probably have done what you asked me not to, which has gone, oh, it's to do with the, the, <laughs> the wider policy system. But what I would say more specifically is I would say is, is about discourse and it's around about the discourses we have about this work and about the, the constant boosterism of claiming that art can do anything. And again, I remember <laughs> doing a, a piece of, you know, I did a literature review once that just drew together all of the evidence about kind of what art had had been claimed to be able to mm. do, you know, and there was, there was, there was one paper and I wish I could find it now again to get the reference, but there was a paper that essentially said that art will, will stave off death, you know, and the, the argument was it will extend life and that's to do with well, well there's a piece of graffiti outside of my house that says art saves, <laughs> saves lives. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's the constant ramping up of what the arts sector has promised and one of the things I've really enjoyed at this is, is when we've been using the tools that we designed to then go out and do workshops with people and think about some of these things. There's two elements of it that I've, that I've enjoyed. One is getting people to be honest about the fact that the stuff that they say they want to do is really bloody hard. If, if art could just solve poverty... Um, I mean, why hasn't it? Um, well, if, I, I would propose that it doesn't really want to do that, does it? <laughs> this is, this no, is and that's, so that was my question is, that, you know, I think there's probably a mix. I think there's some people who don't, there's some people who do, but, but fundamentally that's really difficult. And, you know, I've been throughout using some of the, the workshop tools, going to people and saying, what are you promising that you can deliver for £10,000? I mean, really, mm -hmm. you know, are you genuinely saying that you can bring together an entire community um, that has been fractured for some time for you know the cost of a nine-month arts project. Because actually, from a policymaker's point of view, if 10 grand and one artist can bring together a fractured community, well, yeah, great, let's get rid of everything mm. else. We don't need any social work. We don't need any other support. Let's just spend the 10 grand. Art will do it all. Jobs are good. And fundamentally, there has to be honesty about the fact that, that this stuff is limited and that doesn't mean it's not valuable. One of the big arguments we make in the book is to try to disassociate success with value, that something can be valuable. Because we spoke to people who said, yeah, this, this activity I took part in was really valuable for me. It didn't change my life. It's not made me any richer, more confident you know, or integrated. It was valuable. But let's not overstate what it's able to do. So doing that with people has been one of the good things. And then the other thing that I really enjoy doing is with the grid that we have and the different degrees of success or failure. So this is just a very simple tool to help people actually do kind of measurements of, or rather record what they think about the successes or failures of the work. It is disarmingly simple. Yeah, the purpose of the grid is, is because what we identified is that the, the sort of explosion of our obsession with smart goals and objectives is that objectives 
are either pass or fail. You either met the objective yeah. or you didn't. And so when people write funding applications, you know, they write their objectives or the funders have got objectives. And so they then worry about, oh, my God, I've not delivered on that objective. Mm. And so what we found was that people would often point to something else. So if we challenged them on the project and said, well, this project was, was meant to work with young people from uh, lower socioeconomic groups. But actually, when we look at the demographic of who took part, it was mostly middle class children that took part in your theatre group. So your project was a failure. Mm. And what people would say is, oh, no, but it created a great piece of work or, oh, no, but. And that, oh, no, but is perfectly legitimate. And what we didn't mm -hmm. want to do was to delegitimize that. But it was to say that we need to be able to recognize those successes, but not shy away from the fact that it did fail to do what it was it said it was going to do. And so the grid does two things. One is it divides up the potential areas that a project can succeed or fail into five different facets. And we adapted those from, from previous work that had been done in political science. And so those are the purpose of a project, the process of a project, the participation within the project, mm -hmm. the practice of the project, and the profile of the project. And then the other thing it asks people to do is to look at the different degrees of success or failure. So rather than seeing it as an objective that's a, you met it or you didn't, it, it offers six degrees from outright success to outright failure and prompts you at the beginning of a piece of work to say, what would it look like if this was a tolerable failure? What would it look like if this was a um, conflicting success? And what I really like working with people to do this is to really then start to dig into them. What matters more? So, for example, I did some work with, a, with an organization and said to them, okay, for you, in terms of participation, what matters more? Does it matter more for you that the number of people coming is higher? Or does it matter more for you that the, the people who take part are able to shape the way the project works? So which, which of those two outcomes would be better for you? Let's, let's put them in an order in this, in this spectrum. Again, you know, I was talking to people around about work with languages, um, and they were really pleased that you know, they'd managed to work with a group that, that didn't have English as its first language. And I said, well, what about all the other languages? And of course, they were like, oh, that's a bit difficult. And I was like, OK, well, what, let's at the outset of the project, what would be better or worse for you? Would it be better for you to have a greater diversity of languages being spoken, but not to the same depth? Or would it be better for you to focus on one particular language and to produce all of the work in that language? Because for the, this particular project, mm -hmm. what, what is more like success for you and for your stakeholders? And those conversations have been really interesting with people at the beginning of a project because different stakeholders can start to put things in different ways. And what it also asks people to do is it, it and I guess this is the bit where we are probably trying to limit people's opportunities for a bit of sleight of hand, is mm. that at the beginning, if you map it out, when it comes to the end, you then go, okay, well, what did the project most look like in terms of what we said yeah. an outright success or tolerable failure would be? Because you did it at the beginning. Because if you don't do that, then you can get into this thing of just, there will always be successes and you can just point to them. And if they become proxies for the overall success of the project, then we ignore the fact that, you know, it might not have actually delivered on its purpose, which was to, you know, widen the people taking part or benefiting from the, the funding that's available. So I'm kind of wondering whether you're not lulling me into a quite a false sense of security here. I was reassured to hear that you have this resistance to creating a grift for yourself, essentially, because there is every possibility that every time we have a new framework, a new theory, this essentially distracts from the underlying problems. At the Thaler conference, which you hosted with, with Leila in December that I attended, there was a presentation from a well-considered project which had an acronym, had a website, had funding that was trying to do social justice and DEI, diversity, mm. equality and inclusion through social practice works. And it would be no surprise to any of my listeners that I am full of disdain for these kind of activities because I think all they do is take into their own hands ideas that they, they are not there. A couple of days ago, Sivan, Contemporary Visual Art Networks, which have been critical of time and time again, have launched an anti-racist framework in which the only proposal was 
hey, why doesn't the Arts Council fund a whole bunch of organizations, including us, for the next nine years without the pressure of producing anything so we can map out anti-racist approaches? Now, I'm not going to you know, come out in against diversity, inclusion, or, or, or pro-racism by any measure. But the question I have for you is, if we were to subject those projects not that I expect you to, to comment on these directly, or am I going to say whether you've been nodding as I've been saying all this or not. If these projects can be dismissed out of hand, what are the possible outcomes of your framework being used the way that it's intended? So without creating this kind of grift cottage industry of consultants who come in and say, okay, you didn't do so well, but here's how we can help you do it a little bit better so it looks better in the assessment next time. You know, it's, you know, it, it's great that you are not prepared to do this yourself. But the fundamental question is what happens to the entire industry? Because mm. one of the possible outcomes is that, say, in five, ten years' time, we have all these matrices, hundreds of organizations and projects have filled out your matrix or equivalent, and we have this massive spreadsheet that says, Oh, look, these projects, when they say they will do community cohesion and they have these resources, they never work. A policymaker, even within theories of bounded rationality, would at some point be able to say, okay, let's stop funding them. Yeah. So, of course, we're back to square one, because if there's any possibility of your project, of your framework being successful, that has to make it possible that, that it will have yeah. these kind of negative deleterious effects for the industry. And the industry yes. ain't stupid. You know? It's going to try to find a way of preventing that. I mean, this is the whole failure of the kind of positivistic approach to, to art as a solution to any problem other than problems of aesthetics. You know? So what's the best case scenario? So, so yes, both for Leila and I, that would be a failure. And it's the failure that I think at the moment we are very live to and going, that's the direction of where mm. the project is, is, will go. And there is, there's an odd tension, you, know, you sort of touched upon it before, which is on one hand, I'd quite like to just go, everything we did was open access. Everything mm. we did was freely available. The book is open access. All the journal articles are open access. Just use yeah. the stuff. And so just go and make use of it. And, and never speak to either of us again. You know, you don't even need to mention our names in relation to this. Because otherwise it becomes about us and it becomes about our mm. framework and using that framework. But the flip side, as you say, is the danger then is it starts to get co-opted and used in a yeah. way that is the exact opposite of what the, the framework was for. And so again, there's this sort of push and pull between saying, no, no, we need to continue to be involved because otherwise the essence of what this is asking, because the danger of the choices that we've made in terms of the book, in terms of producing it as a toolkit, is that a toolkit provides a way in for people. Mm -hmm. But completing the tool is not the end of that process. And the hardest thing, the thing that we have failed to do throughout this work, and we've tried it on a number of occasions, is to get people to then make their acknowledgement of the failure public. So we have asked organizations to write blogs throughout the project mm. with us um, that we were going to put an arts professional about failures that they were engaged in. We've spoken to people about saying, okay, publish your grid at the beginning of a project and at the end of it, publish where you got to with it. Dude, um, that, that cannot you know, have happened. No, one. no, that's what I'm saying. That these are, that's the failures that we are dealing with because it is the transparency it's the, the fear of that judgment. And again, you know, part of the work we were doing laterally was trying to work with funders to say, on your website, you need to have stories of failure alongside the stories of success mm. in your projects. Because the only way in which this can start to shift and to change is if people are not ashamed and fearful of acknowledging that there's a failure. Because if you're not even going to start acknowledging it, then, then actually changing or doing the hard work that says, look, you're failing. I really don't want to have to take the funding away from you. I don't want to have to you know, close you down. But, but we need to see things altering and also bringing out into the open some of the assumptions that, that, that sit underneath this work. And I guess some of my work in the past has been informed by the work of um, Jacques Rancière mm -hmm. um, and a particular position 
that starts from the assumption of equality. That equality is not something that is given. It is not something that you help somebody achieve through a project. You start from the assumption that people are equal. And if you assume that people are equal, then how should you distribute resources and how should you distribute what the, the offering is that is there? And fundamentally, that would be the dream for me, is a, is a model of arts policy that starts from an assumption of equality, that, that all cultural life, all cultural activity is as valuable. Now, that opens up a massive problem with a limited scope of resource. Mm -hmm. But you then are approaching it from a different way, which says, OK, how do we distribute this resource equitably on the basis that people's cultural lives are equal, not this assumption yeah. that you need to help people become more equal um, by including them. Again, and one of the things that I, I think about this project that I hadn't really thought about from the outset, that might, be a, that might be something positive that comes out from it, again, depending on how it's used, is we've actually had a few people in art schools have said, oh, I'd really like to use this as part of the teaching that I do. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I've, you know, I've not taught in an art school, I didn't go to an art school. Um, but I am aware of some of what is taught and what is not taught. And again, uh, I was quite surprised, as I'm often surprised, about, about what the training for people who do this type of work does or does not engage with yeah. and the extent to which it, it, it doesn't grapple with some of these elements. Um, because actually, if, if we start to change that narrative as well um, with the people that are doing the work, then, then it would be good. But yes, for me, some of this is, is, is fundamentally around about getting to a point where we are evaluating less, we are spending less money on evaluation, we have less people doing evaluations. We recognize that a lot of what we say we want to do with this type of work takes time, will go wrong, uh, will not have the desired outcomes, and that actually we need to zoom back and to evaluate the policy more than the intervention. You know, we obsess about kind of over evaluating one intervention with one group of people doing one arts project and trying to, to extrapolate out mm. from there. And actually, we don't get any, we certainly don't get any new information. And all that's doing is basically a monitoring task. And we can do that very simply. Yeah. You know, what did people spend the money on? Was it appropriate? Yes, fine. They didn't, you know, they didn't go uh, and profligate, uh, spend the money on something they shouldn't have done. So let's stop doing all of that. And then let's start using a wider evaluation of, for example, all of the funding that is given in Scotland to participatory art. What is the logic? What is, what is it that we would be happy with in two years' time? Mm -hmm. What is it we would be happy with in five years' time? And that's what the grid starts to do, is it tries to push you to have questions. It says, what is closer to success? Because a lot of this is so rhetorical. Who can argue against greater diversity and equality? Nobody. So of course you say this project's going to be, you know, about diversity, yeah. great. The project's going to be equality, brilliant. But actually, what would be closer to success for you? Would it be that the, you know, at the end of this project, the staff in the organization, three of them have left and have been replaced by people from different ethnic backgrounds? Might that be what success looks like? It's probably not for success for the staff who have left, but in terms of diversifying the people who are making the art form. And it's a roundabout recognising that different people can have those different perspectives. But again, we go back to the Scottish Household Survey, and one of my favourite things to do if I'm being annoying, um, if I'm talking to colleagues in the policy environment, we monitor cultural participation. We, we report on that data. That's, that's in the cultural strategy. Now, the data that we report on is, have you engaged with one of the following in the last 12 months? And so there's a range of things in there. And again, I've, I've written a paper before kind of pointing out the gaping holes in terms of what is and what isn't included, um, and thus to a certain extent yeah. making it not that valuable. But even leaving that to one side, I often ask our policy colleagues, and I say, so is that the aspiration in Scotland? Is the aspiration that people do something culturally meaningful once every 12 months? Because that's, <laughs> that's, that's what we're monitoring and yeah. we're reporting. So, uh, you know, how much? And I think for me, these are... Because the other thing that I get frustrated with is that, to a certain extent, there's a bit of a dead end in a lot of this research. And I mean, I'm, you know, I can be as guilty of it as anybody else. But it's how do we start to move these things forward to ask, to explore some of these questions that at the moment make people feel really uncomfortable, like 
okay, well, how often do we need to be doing something culturally meaningful for it to make a difference mm. to us? Is it once a year? Is it every week? Is it, you know, five times a year? We need to start exploring discussions that say things like, you know, are there differences between going to a, a gallery and going to a, a piece of dance? Maybe there is, maybe there's not. But at the moment, all of the work is so oriented towards defending the fact that taking part in culture is good um, and essentially defending the status quo that we're not necessarily learning new stuff about cultural lives and about how we do that and and the way in which people right now who are really struggling financially are still prioritizing things that I would argue are cultural. They're still yeah. finding ways in which to have a cultural life. And to me, that says the cultural sector doesn't need to be fearful about its irrelevance. Culture is fundamental to you know, all of what we do, and people will defend it even when they don't have much to do. But we are not looking at that nuance and to maybe go, well, actually, you know, there is no problem here. But what there is, is there a problem that our live music venues are closing down or that our pubs are no longer as accessible to people because that's where their cultural life was happening. Mm. And without expanding our mind to recognize that what we are doing in terms of asking people to come to these organizations are failing, I don't want to jump to the solution and whether the solution is cutting funding or not. My point is we need to recognize and then say, perhaps there isn't a problem here for people. There might be a problem for those organizations, but in terms of people's cultural lives, maybe there is no problem if they don't go mm. to these organizations. And that then prompts you to something else, which says, well, what is the problem? And again, that always goes back to one of the first interviews I did back when I did my PhD. And it's always stuck with me was a woman that I spoke to had three kids. And I talked to her about you know, what she did and her, her cultural participation, what she would like to do. And she was like, I know that the museum is free in Edinburgh. She's like, I'm constantly told the museum is free. I'm told by various people that I can go along. I've been, it's fine. And um, she was like, but nobody's interested in the fact that I've never been able to take my kids to the cinema. Huh. She's like, I've never been able to take my kids to go and see a blockbuster film. I don't have the money. And she was like, and I want to have that with my kids. And it's that that I worry most about is that in our obsession with trying to fix a problem that may not exist for certain people, we're ignoring the problems that they do have, which is a model that says you need a minimum amount of money to live on in the world and a minimum amount of security. And we don't recognize that having a cultural life, but not just being given it for free, the ability to exert your own agency in that cultural life is a fundamental part of a good life as well. Gosh, David, I was going to suggest, as you were talking, I was going to interrupt you and, and suggest that we move on to something positive to end on, but you've managed to <laughs> kind of, with a double-edged sword, to, to move towards both a positive and a negative in one, because we spoke, I think, at some volume about the policy frameworks, we talked about organizations, and and I think the question, which of course you do to end the book with, is what, what do the individuals have to say about this? What are the quote-unquote participants? Mm -hmm doing in order to to be eligible to be part of this conversation and i think yeah that's the question that, that we have ignored as an industry for an incredibly long time that's not to say that we don't have frameworks for listening to the participant but we i mean we, we are running essentially a kind of industrial racket in which some of the tensions and insecurities of the culture sector come from the fact that when culture is defunded by the state or by, by benefactors, it also loses the ability to reinforce certain cultural values. So in the conversation in which, you know, we talk about people going to the pub because that's a, that's a place in which culture can be reproduced. That's kind of both beautiful, but also horrific to, to the cultural sector. I would point to the example of Belfast Collective called Array winning the Turner Prize a couple of years ago with an installation that reproduced a pub inside a museum. I mean, that mm. points to complete the kind of craziness in which social life, the basic infrastructure of cultural sociality that a pub on your local high street would have served until not so long ago, that that now needs to be professionalized, funded by the state and, and reproduced inside a museum as some kind of curiosity so that professionals have come back and tell tell regular people, quote unquote, how to be social together. So I think 
your formulation of, you know, how, how do I get to afford to take my kids to see a Marvel movie will continue to make the culture industries deeply, deeply insecure. But then thankfully, some policymakers, I don't know, thankfully, not thankfully, I mean, a lot of policy counts Marvel as part of the creative industries. So I guess it all comes out of the same budget in the end. But it's, and this is where I think there's, there's two things I would say on the, that point. One is, is whether the cultural sector needs to make a different argument about its legitimacy. Mm. You know, we, Leila and I are not out on a kind of a quest to defund things. I often get, you know, accused of that. They're like, oh, well, nothing's going to get funding anymore. What I'm saying is that there are other arguments as to why you may want to fund that don't rely upon you co-opting other people's cultural participation or presenting them as a problem. You know, mm. um, for a lot of people we spoke to, they said, yeah, I don't go. It doesn't matter that I don't go. And actually, I'm perfectly happy for it to be funded. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to attack it. I'm interested in my own cultural life. And I think a need for humility that says, you know, approaching people without the assumption that they need you in any way. And the second thing that, and I have to give Layla the credit for this, because A, she was the one that kind of identified it, and she's always reminding me about it, is that one of the most striking things is that the artists, the professionals that he spoke to, never describe themselves as participants, mm. despite the fact that, of course, they participate in culture. There is always this sense of that's not us. So even when they are participating in culture, they're always participating from their professional stance. And another paper that I wrote once before, which is possibly, I think, my favorite, although probably is the one that's least read, is where I took lots of quotes that I had from mm -hmm. people that said things like, oh, I hate the opera. I, you know, it's not for me. Um, I hate dance with an absolute passion. I don't go to the theater. So really classic, you know, non-participant phrases. And I kind of, I, I set these up in the article. These are all from interviews with senior professionals in the art sector, people who are <laughs> curators, people who are running organizations who say exactly the same thing. And that's, that's the argument that I think kind of sits across a lot of this is if we start to see each other as all cultural participants, mm. um, and actually, we are curious about each other's cultural participation, that all of us participate in culture. But what's fascinating is we all do it in different ways. You start to have a bit of humility. But as you say, it also requires a stepping back from the need to professionalize everything and to divorce that sense that cultural participation. And again, one of the, probably the provocative things that I'll say at an event is it doesn't need the cultural sector to survive. Cultural participation is perfectly fine without it. Um, <laughs> But the cultural sector, if it gives due respect to cultural participation, can use it um, as a way to enrich all of the other activities that it does. And all those activities are, are valuable. So, again, I think I've managed to, uh, yeah, I think I've managed to both simultaneously slip in a compliment and a dig at the same time. But, you know, maybe that's, that's my way. Well, brilliant, David. I think maybe as a bonus, we should record that paper with all the quotations, set it to music and see whether it makes it to the charts. David, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the conversation and thanks to you and Leila for the work. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I've really enjoyed talking about it. Um, thanks for inviting me on. Failures of Culture Participation by Leila Jansovic and David Stevenson is published by Parker of Macmillan and is available as a free open access download. I'm Pierre Delancer. Thanks for listening. Join us next time. Thank you.